Welcome to the Virtual CPA Success Show, where we're 100% focused on helping service-based businesses achieve success. Are you a business owner interested in learning how to scale your business? Has your business reached over $1 million in annual revenue? Then this podcast is for you. Okay, welcome to today's episode. I'm Tom Waddleton. I'm a virtual CFO at Summit CPA Group, a division of Anders CPA and Advisors. Um, I'm joined as usual by Adam Hale, a partner at Anders CPA and Advisors. Welcome, Adam. And also John Hello, Tom. And John is the founder and CEO of Humoriso, an HR outsourced global consulting firm. John, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and the company? And then we'll jump into other topics. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, uh, Humoriso, uh, as you shared, is an HR consulting firm, and we have been around for over 10 years, um, providing all kinds of HR support to organizations uh, across the country. Uh, a lot of that work um, really being done either in partnership with HR practitioners that are working within an organization or even for organizations that have no HR presence internally. Uh, they'll lean on us for HR support. Uh, and I have been involved with human resources for a little over 30 years. I know it's shocking if you're looking at me and <laughs> yes. that it's been that long, uh, but it has been. And uh, I am originally from the Philadelphia area and so got my start uh, in the late 80s uh, at, uh, in big box retail. Um, and so started it for a uh, department store there uh, and then just moved through various industries uh, through the years, up into primarily strategic HR roles um, for the for the last mm, probably sixteen years of my career before I started Humoriso okay. again over. So your career trajectory in HR started inside companies as an employee doing HR activities, yes. and then got to the point where you're working with Absolutely. multiple companies. It wasn't called HR back uh -huh. then, Tom. It was called oh, personnel. Oh, I do remember that. Yes. When I was... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I do actually. Yeah. Good call. Yep. Good call. The, uh, you know, before we get started though, there's just something that I got to get out of the way because we were discussing before we jumped on here, like his, uh, superhero, if yes. you'd slide to the side there, his, his great artwork back there. So we were having a small debate on who the best superhero was. And John, I have to say that your name alone just kind of speaks like you would be in one of those jo yeah, John Baldino, that. right? Yeah. That or a mobster movie, yeah. right? Like one yes, or the other. I talk about um, the mobster He, he did say Philly and about... Jersey and all that stuff. So there's, there's, a, there's a type test. Right? I know, yeah. So, it's, so, so there's some of that. Um, but, you know, I had, I had said who my, you know, number one superhero was because I just think that he's, you know, undefeatable, which would, of course, be mm -hmm. Superman. I know everybody listening would agree with yeah. me. But what I didn't hear before we started, like if you could be a superhero or who you think the best one is, just real quick before we jump into it, just so people can get an understanding of who you actually right. are to decide whether they want to keep I listening or not. This is absolutely <laughs> yeah. the litmus test of my veracity as a professional. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, I'm I'm a Spider-Man guy, always have been. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. What's your, so what's that's the, good, what that's is your good, main reason yeah. of saying you'd want to be Spider-Man? Um, I love, uh, I mean, a couple of reasons. One, I just love the idea of um, the the extraordinarily ordinarily, ordinary being accidentally given an entire different trajectory of life, mm -hmm. right? One spider bite and mm -hmm. my entire world changed, right? Um, I think it's pretty cool. And, and um, he is one of the only superheroes where you don't see any of his skin. And so anybody oh. can be Spider-Man. Interesting. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. Well, you passed the test. This is and now. This is this feels like it's a good segue into how you got yeah. started. Um, <laughs> you just the ordinary to extraordinary, right? Like, <laughs> so, so, um, so talk to where I am, Spider Man. I'm hoping to ultimately find that that universe. Yes, I want to find. Continue it. to pick up egg sacs and get bit over and over and go through the trauma without the superhero. Huh? That's right. What I do, what I do think is extraordinary, though, um, John, and, and the reason why we wanted to have you on the show 
is because what, what I think is atypical in your space, uh, at least it has been for us. So delivering virtual CFO services and the financial side to clients um, for us in the way that we do it is pretty unique. I think more and more firms are starting to kind of catch on to being more advisory and being able to offer, you know, this the spectrum of services from the very tactical to the advisory, um, you know, strategic right. level. Um, you know, they, they live in different spots there, but rarely um, whenever we would engage with a client, you know, sometimes, like you said, they had internal resources in HR, like finance, though, a lot of times they were just people that it became an and job and they handle yeah. payroll and they handle benefits administration. Um, and some of it's due to the size of the company, right? Like if it's not if it's not big enough, then maybe it doesn't warrant having us or you involved, albeit they could probably use us at different degrees. But I think what was unique that whenever, and, and the reason why I cling to you so fast is because most of the time I would find just individuals out there that were really good at mm-hmm. one or the other. Um, and, and most of the blocking and tackling was done by, you know, you'd have to go to the payroll company or the, you know, you would go to the PEOs of the world. And I mean, I couldn't tell you how many times whenever I'd call them and ask them a question and they'd never know the answer. And they'd say, well, you got to ask your CPA. And I'm like, uh, that's me. And no, the payroll person should know this answer, which is the reason why I'm on the phone with you, because this is what you do every day. Um, you know, whenever it came to, pay, you know, to benefits administration and all those kind of things. So uh, again, what I found really unique and love to kind of dig into kind of your thought process and how you built that out. And we can maybe talk about some of the service lines, but um, is that you were able to scale to more than just you or two people. Like you have a good size company and you have that spectrum of services where you can kind of help somebody with, you know, again, the day-to-day blocking and tackling all the way up to some of those strategic services that are also desperately needed um, from the company. So again, I do think that you've already hit the extraordinary from my perspective, because again, I just don't run into that a whole lot. So can you tell us a little bit about that journey and how that started? Did it start with <clears throat> doing the blocking tackling? Or yeah, where did I mean, that where did that go? First of all, thanks. I mean, really, all jokes aside, thanks for the way in which you said that. And, and I mean, it really started, uh, I look at it in a couple of different ways. First, I think when it comes to the way in which an organization receives human resources, and what I mean by that is, um, when I sit within an organization, what's my, what's my vibe of HR? If HR is only the police, mm. then that's all they'll ever be. And so they're going to run around and be the employee compliance police. Now that's not to say that compliance doesn't matter. It's to say though, that if the context of compliance is that's the beginning, middle and end, It's a stunted view and it really does a disservice not only to HR as a discipline, but to each employee's experience of what work ought to be like. That being said, you have to earn the right to be heard. And so in an organization, how do you do that? Well, you have to know your stuff. You got to know to your to your question, Adam, about the blocking and tackling. You got to know the blocking and tackling. Mm -hmm. I got to know that when someone comes to me and says, um, I just found out that I'm pregnant. I uh, want to know what what leave will be like. It's not today. It's down the road. And if if immediately my response is, oh, it's over. <laughs> just stop. you don't don't worry about the fact that I don't know what the compliance is. Let me go look it up. You already told them what you, the spirit of compliance is going to look like, right? Uh, and yeah. I think that that there are too many HR people. Um, who, ugh, a whole lot. And so what I noticed in my own journey within human resources um, and the last role that I had before I left to, to start human Reso was VP of HR for a national bank. And, and I would run into other, you know, banking professionals uh, in this space who were just no fun. <laughs> they just were a human <laughs> beings. Really? Huh. Um, <laughs> except when they went to the annual, you know, bankers and insurance convention. Yes. Oh, right, sure. Right then they were the life of the party um, for about 10 minutes before they passed out uh, and uh, uh, lightweights. And, and uh, uh, it was like, why? How come you can have 10 minutes of, of an approachable personality there? But the rest of the year, you 
you're just in your office door shut, sitting at your desk. Ugh, that is just not the way HR is supposed to function. So I saw that reality. And I would also say I saw the reality of outsourcing. When I started, as I said, you know, a long time ago uh, in personnel, we were doing payroll in house, mm -hmm. literally, you know, the big book of the tax grids, because Pennsylvania is very complicated. And so, you know, yes, right, like the, right, the school tax, the local tax, and we had like two rulers to line up to find what that percentage mm -hmm. was going to be, you know, like you were doing that. Well, what ultimately happens? More organizations are using payroll platforms, outsourcing that liability, bringing in technology to make the, the function of payroll easier, not only for finance, but for the employees who receive the pay. You know, we're, we're at a place today where everybody's got an app and they can look at their pay stubs right on their phone and they can do this and that. It, it has traveled a path from that initial outsourcing. When I was in personnel, again, all that time ago, we had major medical. We weren't really doing all of the huge benefit plans for employees, for health benefits, that sort of thing. HMOs were there, but everybody was a little freaked out about them. Who pays $2 to go to a doctor? What the heck is this, right? So those things started to um, influence um, a comfort around outsourcing. And again, carrying that forward, I thought there's too many organizations that are under 100 employees, that aren't going to hire a VP of HR level expert to come in and help set their organization up for success in that discipline, because it wouldn't be financially prudent. They can't afford right. that level of expertise. Right. So what if we built something where they could access that level of expertise in an outsourced model, the way in which they're accessing that level of expertise in a payroll platform, in a benefits administration connection through a brokerage, and that's where Himariso was born out of. And so we took, I took a shot to see if my hunch was right. And, you know, here we are. And it's, it's, you know, it's that's, been right. That's a great story. <laughs> and I'm sure over time, yeah. you've found no, the acceptance a, it, of more and more outsource and listening to them an advisor is coming up so much that people are used yeah, to I mean, doing that now. 10 years ago is probably a challenge, wasn't it? That's right. That well, and it's it's funny too because one of the things that I would say as well. So this is this is true, right? So I left the the organization I was with January. I'm sorry, July 31st, 2012, and uh, August 1st is when Humoriso started the next day. But I I went to breakfast the next morning with someone that I knew was a CEO of an organization. He was like, I want to pick your brain to see why you know you left because I, I I didn't have to leave. We were doing great work. Good stuff was happening. And I had breakfast with him and told him this vision. And he said, awesome. How do I sign up to have you come in and be a <laughs> part of it. my company? So I left breakfast that next morning. Honestly, not even have, I didn't even have Humoriso like filed at yes. the state yet, right, as a company. And, and so I say that to say um, it was such an immediate, very like wh what a kind blessing for me to get that immediate validation that this could have legs, right? And I agree with you though, Tom, like as the years have gone on now, um, so many more people are comfortable with various types as you, you know, as both of you know, as well, right. With yeah. outsourcing. Yeah. yeah. Outsourcing, not having to be physically in the low. I mean, so yes, they're okay. And they understand that there's, um, it, you know, there's, there's not only a need, you know, so from a financial perspective, it, it makes sense, but sometimes it's a trade off. Right. But, but the, the one thing there is, is it's not only the cost of the person that's there, you have, you take care of all the employee drama because you've got that all on your side. If there's turnover, you know, you've got that kind of built in, you're managing that. But I think the other thing that people don't think about a lot of times is the project yeah. management. So whenever they bring in like a controller or if they brought in an HR person from your standpoint, it's like, but who's their resources and who's watching over them and making sure those things are getting done on a regular basis. And with, with your company and with our company, what we're able to do whenever we go into a situation like that is they have a team of a network around them and that project management kind of already built into it. So they have layers of support, both upstream and downstream to be able to help them and being able to bundle that in a fractional manner. Um, even though it's a, again, it's a, it's a subscription, you know, a, a fractional piece to a, a broader team. That's really what most of these small businesses need. Now, whenever you get to 500 or 5,000 employees, well, sure. Now it makes sense to just bring us in for little, you know, small yeah. projects and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, we, we were in the exact same boat and kind of had that same validation. And I, 
you know, agree with like over the years, it's just gotten, you know, where people almost expect it or mm -hmm. really demand it, you know, cause they don't want to correct. Do that. And I would say, um, when I started, I thought small to l lower mid market size organizations were going to be really the audience for me. And, uh, I wasn't wrong, right. The, the, certainly that, that, uh, group of organizations are my audience, but what's been really interesting to see as the years have gone on is how far upstream it's gotten that enterprise level organizations are reaching out saying, can you bring that expertise? I, I had a conversation with, I can't say the company, but a really, 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 <laughs> really, really big company, really big company who said, uh, can you come in and work with our organization uh, on workforce planning? And I said to him, I was like, what? Are you kidding me? You have 300 people on the HR team. And his response was, they don't know how to do that. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying. It's like it's sometimes even in those bigger situations, it, and, and oftentimes it's just that outside insight too, right? Like a professional or an expert sometimes is just somebody yeah. from out of town with a suitcase. Yeah. You know, there is a lot of uh, legitimacy sure. to somebody from outside the organization being able to come in and say the same thing. Everybody's looking around the table going, that's what we've been yeah. talking about right. for the last couple right. of years. <laughs> but now all of a sudden everybody's yeah. listening. Uh, so there's definitely value to that yeah. as well. But, um, you know, not to say that you wouldn't bring in additional insight yeah. and a different perspective of doing stuff, but I'm just saying in general, I think there's a ton of value um, as it relates to that. But uh, just kind of shifting gears a little bit, I think what would be um, what would be kind of a cool way to take the conversation, we can kind of move things around a little bit, but um, is to kind of break down some of the services that you provide, because, again, that's what attracted me to to your team and everything was that it's like, oh, well, for us, we'll do payroll. So we don't do the payroll, you know, the actual like paying the liabilities and stuff like that. Everybody mm -hmm. should be using a platform like Gusto or ADP. You'd like name the software. It doesn't really matter, but there's still an administrative right. component that, that has to be done with that. You know, even PEOs that are hands off or oftentimes not right. even remotely close to being hands off. So, um, so there's, so there's a lot to that. Um, and so we'll handle that administration. We'll update people's stuff. We'll pay it, but we have to be very explicit in there. And actually in our SOW, we have this thing that says we are not HR administrators. We do not do benefit administration. We do not, you know, man, it, we, we can't do that stuff. That's not in our wheelhouse. Whereas whenever I was talking to you, you do that. And then you kind of, you built upon all those things. So you can handle the payroll administration, which we would <laughs> <Yes>. gladly off <laughs> like send to you. <laughs> so, so thank you. But then on top of it, a parallel service that makes sense naturally. And the reason why we had so much client confusion was because naturally then it's like, well, then you also handle the benefits right. administration. Right. It's like, no, we don't, but with you, you yeah. do. So can you kind of talk to us about kind of the differences there and how those services work? You just, you know, problems and, yeah. and, and, Things of that nature I mean, I would say for. just to sort of set the table, I, I'd say from a um, service category standpoint, we, we really function in five areas. And, and the first area we've been talking about, which is compliance and administration, right? So that is going to be very much considerate of law, case law, uh, policy, looking at city, state, federal, you know, again, not not that I want to keep hearkening back to when I was in personnel, but it was so much simpler then as far as law mm -hmm. was concerned, because most of mm -hmm. it was federal. There was a little bit of state, very little city. The only little bit of city that we ever really had to work about worry about was taxation. Mm -hmm. Right. If you were in Philadelphia, you had wage tax. So that that made a, you know a difference into how you did some process, but it really didn't affect employment law. Well, fast forward. We even have municipalities that now, you know, are passing things that affect employment related relationships. And so it, it is a very robust component when you're thoughtful about being compliant and what that means. Add on to the fact that we have more organizations that are distributed because of the net effect for many organizations of the pandemic. Um, we yeah. already had opera as Humoriso, we actually were already a distributed workforce. We were operating in that model before the pandemic. That actually was really great for us, not only to keep things steady internally, but we were so familiar that all of our clients that needed to make this transition 
we, we were firsthand, mm -hmm. right, about what had to happen and how you had to handle it and how much compliance. So that organization that's in Sheboygan that hired their first person in L.A. and they want to know there's no difference. And you said uh, that's a mistake. <laughs> Sorry, everybody you're from L.A. <laughs> you're allowed to discriminate by geography. That's not a protected class. So no one from California. Um, the, but, but the reality is, again, they wouldn't have a reason to know these things, right? These organizations, don't, that's not their wheelhouse. That's not their expertise. So that compliance component married to the administration, Adam, that you're talking about. So that full employee life cycle, we call it from offer to offboarding, mm. right? Like, so so if that ever happens, right? So um, all the benefits administration, we can, we jump in, as you said, with payroll processing, we're jumping in with leave administration and leave management is a beast mm -hmm. in and of itself. It's a, it's actually a, a, an entire department within our organization because of how complicated and complex it is to have someone who within an organization who really anecdotally, you know, knows that there's four letters called FMLA, who's responsible for this. It's a big deal. And there's a lot more case law happening as a result of mismanagement of leave. And that's not to be scare tactic. That's just to sort of accentuate the fact that that's why this sort of uh, tandem of compliance and administration makes so much sense. Um, and so we'll manage that full employee life cycle, corrective action, but promotion management as well. Right. Where does performance fit into that? But if somebody leaves helping with COBRA or helping with unemployment responses or, or verifications of employment, whatever these areas are, we're going to, that's going to sit in that bucket for us. Um, and it's, it's a great gateway to build rapport and relationship, quite frankly. And so when we get involved with organizations at that level, it doesn't take very long before they're like, well, what else do you do? Uh -huh. How could we, could you do this? How could, how about this? Right. And so that's where, uh, again, just to do the lay of the land, training and development is another area for us. So that's not only the things that are have to, right? Anti discrimination, mm -hmm. anti harassment, but growth opportunities. Adam's, we see a lot of potential in Adam. How do we, how do we help? Oh, yeah. well, thank you. <laughs> that's the first time I've heard that. This is a for example. Uh, <laughs> but the idea of like, what about his soft skills, mm -hmm. right? Adam, Adam's a, a, an employee, a, a line level employee right now. We have, a, we have a desire to promote him to supervisor. Well, he's a colleague last week. He's their supervisor next week. That's a little bit of a transition, right? How does Adam get set up for success in that? And so helping to sort of develop that whole, all learning management, right? It kind of fits into that bucket for us. Uh, third area is direct hire recruiting, which is connected back, right? They overlap so much, but there's an expertise in these areas. You can't just throw an ad on Indeed and say, gosh, I hope it sure. works out. It's, it's you know, sure. we're going to get 7,000 resumes. You, you know, 6,999 not having anything to do with the, yes. Yes. With the job that you're trying to fill, right? So, and again, not to kind of get into all of it, but that just gives you this idea of like, when you start touching on some of these initial blocking and tackling needs, it opens the door then right for more and more engagement. Sure. Cause you've earned yeah. the trust. Yeah. I mean, I can see how the direct, um, the direct to hire stuff. I mean, a lot of times you have to do recruiting, but there's, there's just, there's a big portion of that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I remember one time the, the guy was aspiring to be a football couch. He couldn't even spell <laughs> coach like on his, <laughs> on his thing. I'm like, do we really need to be looking at these? Um, we could totally do a blooper reel on some of the stuff that, that yes. came our way. So, what about in, in like just kind of digging into a couple of those areas? Uh, I think the training one, you know, and the, you know, obviously on the HR front, there's some software packages that have good, you know, learning training modules there. I think where most um, places struggle from, from my experience is understanding like bands and how to move people along. Like everybody wants to feel useful. Sometimes people want to create trajectories and paths for people, but it's really hard to create those bright lines between moving from one to the other um, because it's not just technical right. skills. Like you mentioned, a lot of times it's the soft skills. It, those are the things that really move people up the upstream. It's, you know, a lot of the technical stuff is kind of permission to play. Like, yeah, you're great at doing X, Y, Z, but can you manage people or can you oversee a department or can you do those right. things? So do you also help them not just with like a soft skill, but do you also help them develop um, what those 
plans could look like or what those bands would look like? And then does that bleed into compensation yeah. also, like compensation planning or how does yes, that? Yes, to all of that, right? So the idea- Sweet, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> uh, the, the idea there is, it's a, it's a really good question because what we still see in so many organizations is Tom's, Tom's here at line level, entry level employee. We like Tom, Tom then gets to move to senior X, X of the role that, that he's doing. And then the next step is Tom to be manager. And the next step is Tom to be director. And the next step is Tom to be BVP. Hoping along the way for either turnover, turnover or death, because that's the only way Tom is gonna move forward, right? Oh, good, good job, Tom, you get to be director because Bob died last week. And so now we need somebody to be director. So congratulations. <laughs> Uh, Make yeah. sure Tom was That's part of that first, and then, yeah. and then he That's can have the right. position. Yeah. 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 That ID channel on cable, yeah. whatever. Yeah, so you'll see the story. The the um, it's such a linear course that most organizations really map and say, "Well, we have career mapping." No, you have a right. career map. Right. Ah, uh, that's not career mapping. It's a career map. Not everyone fits into that, and quite frankly, not everyone should fit into that. We see this most often uh, when we get involved with organizations in sales. When they say, you know, uh, Bobby was, he's great. I mean, he's killing it. Uh, and so we're gonna make him sales manager. And what happens when Bobby becomes sales manager? He's terrible, he's horrible. It happens, it's a story as old as time. It happens over and over and over again. Why is that the case? Well, it's the same reason why all-star superstar athletes are terrible coaches mm -hmm. because they've been trained to be hunters and selfish and focused on what they bring to the game. The best coaches are often the people who sat the bench and were the B and C level player who learned how to have the lay of the land of the whole thing. So if you just keep telling the A level person, you're next to be a manager, don't, don't come to me and complain sure. that six months later, they're unhappy, they left, they got scooped up by a competitor because they wanna get back to what they do well, which is, uh, and I'm just gonna, it is what it is, self-centered hunting that they're really good at. That's why they're the MVP, right? So um, we have to work with organizations to have, it used to be called something called dual ladder progression. Well, you can go this way or this way as you grow in the organization. But quite frankly, it, where we are right now, it could be three, four, five different paths that you can create. And with that, Adam, though, to your point, there's always um, thoughtfulness and we do quite a bit of work in compensation and pay equity analytics because uh, the market moves so much externally from a competitive standpoint. But we also find that internally uh, it's out of whack. And, and I think 2021 is an example. Um, we were just overpaying all kinds of people to do all kinds of jobs and to, to just get them. We needed the talent so badly. Sure, I'm going to give you 10,000 more than the job is even listed at because I need you. Right. Please say yes. What happens to the people in the organization who've been loyal, who are there? Their, their trend for compensation increase just got crushed because, because this person's starting here. They may be making more right now, the experienced person, but as you look at it on you know, math, and I know math is scary for HR people, in regression analytics, it, you're gonna see that the longer you work for the company, the less beneficial it'll be for you. Is that what you wanna be about? Well, we also have some states that are saying, nope, you can't do that. Colorado, New Jersey, that mean they're saying, no, you can't do that. You, you gotta make it equitable for the long term, not just for today. That's hard to manage, right? When you're trying to figure out how to map people for a path forward and be thoughtful about how, how far you can stretch that dollar. Right, it, because again, like you said though, a lot of times it's about how do you create headspace for somebody without the management path or the director path? Like how can you create room yes. for growth, you know, professionally? And, you know, and I know titles aren't everything, but they are to right. the people right. that don't have them. You know what I mean? Like. You know, it's a, it gets really easy to sit on the top of the mountain and go, oh, they don't matter. Well, like, it's, it's, have like, Adam, <laughs> congratulations. We're making you customer service manager three. And you're like, what's the three mean? Like, what, what is the, and <laughs> the HR people will say, well, we've got customer service one, customer service two, customer service three. I don't know that anybody goes home excited at night because there are two instead of a one now. I don't know what that means, right? But if that's, but if you can 
cast the picture, make, you know, somebody sit and help that individual have the same vision that you want to say the company has. We believe in you. The progression is not just about title. It's because of what you'll bring to that title to help us advance, which will then continue to open doors for you to continue to move forward. That's what we see in you. But quite frankly, the other path at times, and here's, a, here's an example, Adam, very specific to, to answer the question. Um, there are times that we will say, uh, Jimmy's been here for three years. Jimmy's great. Uh, he needs to leave. Oh. <laughs> what? What? Jimmy's got to leave. Jimmy needs to go work for maybe a bigger competitor of yours so that Jimmy can pick up the skill sets that you're not prepared to offer at this point or you don't have exposure mm. to at this point. And, and keep the door open. I know it's a risk, but if Jimmy goes and works somewhere for a year, year and a half, and boomerangs back, he's bringing everything with him that he's just learned where he was. The number of boomerang employees that, that uh, were tracked last year increased by 23% from the year before. People wow. leaving, working elsewhere, and coming back because they love the company, but they understood that they could garner skill sets and experiences that they could bring back, and they wanted to come back to the community and culture that they were a part of and now also bring back skill sets that they couldn't get if they had stayed there. And it benefits the company as well. That's huge to see that kind of number happen, of employees returning. Even at Humoriso, we, we had two that left and returned within the past year. Wow. It's, and it's way, awesome because what they brought back is awesome. the way awesome. you're describing it, John, are you, is your hypothesis that people were leaving with the intent of I'm gonna get skill and come back? Not as much, I left, it was kind of cool, but then I looked and the grass really was pretty green where I was. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're very transparent conversations and it's, you, you can't, everybody can't have these conversations, of meaning you know, the major people that are like, Tom, we think you should right. leave. Uh, so you can learn something and then think about us in a year that don't take that HR person out of the room <laughs> yeah. immediately. Oh, I just wrote that down. That's what I was going to do. That okay. Never mind. Scratch that out. <laughs> I thought that was a tip. <laughs> so yeah. You don't want me? But I, you sit with somebody and the, the premise of the conversation first is, what do you think you don't know yet? Mm. What are you observing that you're like, gosh, I wish I could. And you'll hear right from their mouth things that you can address and things that you okay. can't. And when you okay. get to the things that you can't, I ask the question, where do you think you could get that? Mm. If, if we can't give it, what could happen? Now, sometimes, again, this is why there's multiple ladders Sometimes it's, it is about um, a sabbatical mm -hmm. to go and, ex and do a training for a month on something specific. And I see this a lot more in those that are, um, I'd say, more physical type jobs, construction, manufacturing, certain kinds of engineering, where they go and do this sort of immersive mm -hmm. opportunity. I mean, I've even seen organizations pay for an employee to go on a missions trip to go build and engineer wells in certain parts of the world to bring water because what they were going to learn through the project management of that, they could bring back and now have experience in that. It's, it's creative. We have to be much more creative with, with our talent today. We just have So we should just lease employees and share them amongst each other. I mean, you were definitely a half glass uh, full kind of guy. I would say my more pessimistic view of this, and, and I'm kind of this guy, so I, I don't, I don't, despise or discredit anybody for this but a lot of times what i find is that folks get to a certain point of their career they feel like they should be taking two or three leaps yeah. at a time instead yeah, of one and on paper whenever competitor sees them they're like oh wow you're doing a b c d e f g like whew, we would pay you right. ten or fifteen thousand dollars more for that what they don't realize is what they wrote on paper and what they actually do or their competency inside of that there's oftentimes a gap in the reason why you're not making that so then they jump and then they get in over their head yep. a little bit and sometimes they realize the demand and the culture like you said of that other job isn't quite what they had That's Listen, let me job. make sure I qualify this. When I said the statistic on boomerang, there's no way to know if it was an intentional boomerang or a, oh yeah. my gosh, that grass was greener, but it's all weeds mm -hmm. and I'm coming back. Yeah. Right? No way to know yeah. that. So your point is well made. And quite frankly, there are people that I think are 
we have to be thoughtful about our time as well. And that's one of the things we talk about with organizations. You have fought to keep this person who's always been on the precipice of quitting for the last two years. You just keep wasting energy fighting, increasing salary, giving them, changing their job description, really making this unicorn role for this person who's still not happy. Yes, John, what do you think we should do? Let him go. Yeah. yeah. Yep, totally. Look at the ROI of how much time yeah. you've spent on managing this one situation. Is it worth right. it? I can't imagine that it is. I wonder how long your list is of hearing people, you know, Adam is indispensable. We couldn't get along without him. And once Adam is gone, you're like, wow, yeah. people are seem to be doing okay. And that just seems like it's such a long line of that. <laughs> and <list>. better. <laughs> Adam is just an example. I, I, that's <laughs> a great point because you, I will tell you, you see this. Um, and for us, because we are supportive of organizations of all kinds of industries, right? So, so for instance, we support um, some CPA firms, and and this if this tax manager leaves, we're mm -hmm. screwed. Sure. The entire business will fall apart. But I'm hearing the same thing from restaurants that are saying if this particular server leaves or bartender leaves, we're screwed. And I my you know my response is I hear you. Let's talk about how we are affirming that to be true for oh, uh, in the, those in, those particular people. But what happens when that bartender does leave? Let's, let's, let's not tell everybody it's going to be terrible if they mm -hmm. leave. Just shut up, stop saying things. Because if that bartender leaves and we're doing fine, now you can say, whew, truth be told, I thought we were gonna be in trouble if so-and-so left, but all those same customers are coming yep. in. Nobody's coming in and saying, oh, Oh, you know, Billy's not bartending. Susan's not my server tonight. I we're out of here. Nobody's doing that. They're eating, yep. they're drinking. So the same thing with the tax manager. Is it, I'm not saying it's easy, but if that, if, if it's really true that if that tax manager leaves the entire company's in trouble, then you set up your company incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, John, as you talk yeah. about, as you talk to prospective yeah. clients, I'm curious, is there a division in your business and more Here's people who use us for HR outsourcing as sort of a, you're my virtual HR, if that's a term you use, as opposed to more project related where people are coming in saying, okay, in the next X number of months, can you deliver something? And the thought is you'll leave after that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's typically, I would say though, not always, typically uh, the larger clients, I'll say upper mid market to enterprise level uh, organizations, sized organizations, we're doing a lot more projects okay. for them. And so um, we're, we're taking something off the, the, the a, a project that an HR team is trying to get to but can't, either because they don't have the expertise or the time. Um, and so we'll do that. And then we're just always at the ready if they need us for something else in the future. I'll say we see a lot of that work being done in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion mm -hmm. work that we do for these organizations. Overall organizational design and development um, constructs around mergers and acquisitions, centralized, decentralized organization changes, those kinds of things. Um, but sometimes, honestly, Tom, we'll get even small company, very small companies, startups that are like, we're kind of afraid to have HR because, you know, HR has been terrible for all of us where we've come sure. from. And so we don't want to like completely commit to HR. So can you do this project and just do a handbook for us? Because our insurance broker says in order to have liability insurance, we have to have a handbook. Okay, we'll we'll do that, and then they go through that process, and they're like, "Okay, you guys aren't so bad." Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Or they're like, "You guys are terrible." Yeah. Thanks, but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Of it, course not. That, that does happen because sometimes they're like, "We don't like the way you wrote this handbook." What what part? You know, we don't like the way that you wrote the um, Americans with Disabilities mm. portion. Okay, here's the good news: we didn't write that. It's actually law. And so if you put there to be a change in the way that law reads, I'd encourage you to vote differently in the next one. You're smooth. I like it. Yes. <laughs> I, I, That's yeah. kind of how we approach tax a lot of yeah. times. Right. <laughs> Same kind of thing. Not us. I, I, <laughs> you know. You know, I can own what I can own, but when I can, I'm going to just tell you. Like, you don't, well, we don't want, we don't want to give them 12 weeks. We only want to give them six weeks of leave. Well, that's cool, but the law says 12. Well, we're changing it to six. Well, then our name's not going to sure. be on this handbook. That's sure. not the way this works, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. For the outsourced HR part, 
it, would it be common that people would say, yeah. I'm going to continue working with, uh, we mentioned Gusto earlier. So Gusto will continue to do my payroll and I'll have benefits with someone. Can you provide sort of the high level? That would be also something we'd say, yes, yeah. if you're needing the guidance consulting, we do that too. We don't mandate okay. any software, right? So we're supporting clients that are on Gusto, yeah. actually, that are yeah. on Bamboo, that are on ADP, that are on Paycom, that are on, you know, fill in. The, that part is okay with us because we're agnostic yeah. when it comes to the technology. We're agnostic when it comes to the industry. So we have to be agnostic when it comes to the technology. So for instance, we support um, car dealerships. Mm. They have very specific software. Interesting. And even, mm. even some of the payroll software is very specific. Some of their training software is very specific. We have to be able to be flexible to those platforms because good HR, if you're doing good HR, it's applicable across the board. Don't let the systems throw you, mm -hmm. right? You can learn the system. It's harder to learn good HR and implement good HR. So we don't, we try not to let people get in the weeds with that. The only difference I would say, Tom, for some clients would be on that PEO model. So some clients that are on a PEO, they they get HR support as part of the PEO. So I do my hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, been on the other end of that. Yep. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> so um, obviously that PEO is mandating the payroll platform and benefits and that sort of stuff. Um, because we don't sit as a PEO, there are times where a client will have to peel away from the PEO in order to be able to to not have competing HR, right? We're not here to like, you know, speak ill of Trinet or Insperity or any of these places. That's not what it's about. But you already are paying for an HR support. So if you're coming to me saying we're not getting HR support, I I I have to still function because they're the employer of record on yep. the pay stubs and uh, their name is what's there. So I can't ignore mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Right. So in terms of size wise, I mean, I've, I've, what I've heard you say too is like very small startup company and I've heard you say enterprise, yeah. but you know, in terms of the majority of the folks that are coming to you, at what point, like what size, I assume it's, you know, head yeah. count, um, at what size are you typically? Uh, we're, we're with? a little over 65% or between 50 and 500 employees. Okay. Okay. That makes oh, a lot of okay. sense. Yeah. Of the right of the kind of the regular project or retained base HRO type. Yeah. That's about where they are. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we find that for ours, it's like, I don't know why, it's just like the magic number is right around 30 or 35. Um, and it, so this makes a lot of sense to me, because obviously there's that magic 50 number that everybody hears about, but um, but it seems like the COO is the one doing operations, HR, and finance to some degree, whether that's the owner COO right. or an actual you know, so they have, they wear all three of those hats and it seems right around 30, 35, they've raised their hand up and they're like, okay, I can still handle the HR stuff. I can't handle right. the finance right. stuff. So then they find us around 30 to 35 people. And then right around 50 people, they're like, okay, now we're getting to the size where it's time to talk to a PEO or it's time to talk to an outsource mm -hmm. solution, you know, to start piecemealing that out. So I think that, I mean, I, that lands well with like what we see too from a lot of our Correct. clients um, asking us to do those sources, you know, or find somebody that can yeah, do it. I think you're right. Because by the time it gets to us um, at that size, um, the finance person is, is trying to wear the hat of HR as well. And most finance people, respectfully, are, you know, hate it and they really stuck with it yes, because of yes. payroll and so they're like, right, right that's that's why yeah, yeah. I, I think no, it sounds like a great. great solution that you offer and adam and i do coaching of small cpa firms but any company would have this but as people try to move in a different direction so many people are moving toward that advising role often what we're coaching people mm -hmm. is think about who the right people are in doing that kind of thing for the role. Think about your internal pay for how you pay people and all these things that are very HR related and knowing you would have that service. I'm sure it's overwhelming to them to say, and also your hiring process, yeah. are you good at hiring the right people? I could see them reaching out to you and saying, okay, I want to move a different direction. I'm hearing all these to do's and don't know how I could see them coming to you and saying, yes. here's what I think the future looks like. Help me with that. I think there's a great resource for them to have. Absolutely. Totally. And, and I think that, that one of the, probably the most refreshing things mm -hmm. that happens in those conversations is literally just having the conversation. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like when they feel they can sit with somebody and just say, this is what I think I see. Mm -hmm. This is, this is honestly how it feels when I see this. Cause there are times where they'll talk to us and I'll say, you don't oh, need us. That's not what you're describing. 
what you what you see is this this and this let you know we can help you get there but you don't need us the way that you think you do here's what and and that's honestly for that person it's like honestly 90 percent of it is i've I'm sure. heard and i didn't know where to go with this and the other 10 percent is okay now i have sort of marching orders to know where to go with it that's great, great. that's good john this has been so yeah. enjoyable Thank you very much. I think we've gotten some really good tips and I think also an offering that you have that many companies would look and say, oh, I need to talk to them about either ongoing service or a specific project that's in there. Thanks. It's been great. Thank you for having me. Really, Thanks. it's been fun. Enjoy this podcast? Visit our website at summitcpa.net to get more tips and strategies for achieving business success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry. 